Five years after the death of their iconic leader Yasser Arafat, Palestinians seem no closer to the dream of an independent state. What has been the effect of Arafat's absence? Would peace have reigned if he was alive? Or is he to blame for the current division and impasse in the peace process? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Imran Garda. Yasser Arafat, a man widely revered as the father of the Palestinian struggle for statehood. It's five years since the death of the former Palestinian leader. On Wednesday, tens of thousands of Arafat supporters gathered in the West Bank to mark the day. His successor, President Mahmoud Abbas, addressed the crowd. As he paid tribute to the iconic leader, Abbas reiterated that he will not attend peace talks until Israel stops building new settlements. Ceremonies in the Hamas-run Gaza Strip were banned. Well, Arafat was a public figure for more than five decades. He was called a terrorist at one point and then awarded the Nobel Peace Prize at another. Mohamed Shukair looks back at the history and legacy of Arafat. Yasser Arafat, a symbol of the Palestinian struggle for independence. He was one of the founders of the Fatah movement in 1959. Ten years later, he became the chairman of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Arafat and the PLO operated from Jordan and then Lebanon before relocating to Tunisia in 1982. The PLO charter endorsed armed struggle against Zionist imperialism. But that changed in 1988 and at the height of the first uprising in the occupied territories, Arafat declared the PLO would accept a state in the West Bank and Gaza. He soon began secret talks with Israel sponsored by Norway. That led to the PLO renouncing violence and recognizing Israel's rights to exist. In return, Israel recognized the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people. The talks resulted in the signing of the Oslo Agreement in September 1993. For this, Arafat won a Nobel Peace Prize with Israeli leaders Shimon Peres and Ishaq Rabin. The agreement created the Palestinian Authority, and Arafat was given limited control over parts of the West Bank and Gaza. Oslo was meant to lead to the establishment of a Palestinian state, but final status negotiations stalled despite repeated summits. At the Camp David talks in 2000, Arafat refused to budge under American and Israeli pressure to sign a peace deal he felt was inadequate. The collapse of the talks was soon followed by a second intifada, triggered by Israeli leader Ariel Sharon's controversial visit to Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem later that year. Israel and the Bush administration refused to deal with Arafat, branding him a terrorist once again. He was trapped in his compound in Ramallah for the final two years of his life. In November 2004, he succumbed to a mysterious illness and was airlifted to a hospital in Paris, where he died days later. Mohamed Shukir for Inside Story. Well, joining us today are our guest in Dusseldorf, Jamal Nazal, a member of the Revolutionary Council of Fatah. In Barcelona, Azam Tamimi, the director of the Institute of Islamic Political Thought and an author on Hamas. And in Tel Aviv, Yuri Avneri, a writer and founder of the Gush Shalom Peace Movement. Thank you very much, gentlemen, all of you, for uh, joining us. If I could start off with Mr. Nazal, is Yasser Arafat's dream dead? It is not. We still strongly believe that it is possible uh, to uh, achieve the uh, two-state solutions, although with Mr. Netanyahu it might be very difficult. I uh, know that times can change very quickly. I was 11 years old when Uri Avneri went to Lebanon to meet Yasser Arafat, and at that time he was uh, the Israelis raised charges against him for meeting a terrorist. But years later, uh, the Israeli leadership uh, shook, shook hand with Mr. Arafat and signed a peace accord with him. So times can change. Now it may seem difficult. We have a hard uh, wing, uh, gov uh, right wing government in Israel, which is reluctant to peace. But I think the wind of change will come. Is that Yuri Avneri? Is that testament to how things have moved forward? Given that when Mr. Nazal was 11 years old and, and you went to meet Yasser Arafat, he was branded a terrorist. And is that testament that things moved a long, long way in the ensuing years? The basic facts of the struggle have not changed. There is an Israeli people and there is a Palestinian people in this country, and there's no way but to make peace between them. The only alternative is a catastrophe, a catastrophe for both peoples. 
and therefore the basic facts are there in the assessment which Yasser Arafat made in 1974 to move from a revolutionary movement and from the armed struggle towards a settlement with Israel, the, this assessment still stands. There is no other way, neither for Israel nor for the Palestinians. Yuri Avneri says there's no other way. I wonder what Azam Tamimi thinks. Mr. Tamimi, looking back now, did Arafat make the right choice in becoming Arafat the politician, Arafat the president, Arafat the negotiator, as opposed to Arafat the resistance leader? Well, the dream that uh, was born in 1957 uh, when uh, five men uh, met in Kuwait uh, and uh, laid the, uh, the founding stone of uh, Fatah was uh, soon to be relinquished by uh, Yasser Arafat himself uh, and uh, by whoever uh, remained with him in the Fatah movement. The original dream is the dream of every Palestinian of going back home to our land, the land that was occupied by the Israelis who have no right whatsoever to be in that place because they came from Europe in order to solve somebody else's problem at our own expense. So actually Yasser Arafat used his historic uh, uh, legacy, his historic legitimacy, uh, in order to uh, destroy the same project that he himself uh, started uh, in the very beginning. So are you saying he sold out the Palestinian people? Well, different people will say different things. I think he could not withstand the challenge. Of course, it's very challenging to stand uh, uh, against the entire uh, international community, the world order, uh, uh, an Arab uh, uh, system or an Arab order that, uh, that is too weak uh, to help the Palestinians return home. Uh, and that's why uh, the National Liberation Movement that was uh, uh, started uh, early on came to an end and another movement had to uh, replace it. Jamal Nazal, this idea that by negotiating and as the years went on, Yasser Arafat and uh, the PLO in, in general sold out the Palestinian people, betrayed the liberation that uh, Mr. Tamimi uh, represents. Well, what do you make of that? I actually do not share the radical views that Mr. Tamimi has expressed. It is quite ironic that the uh, movement which uh, represents the interests of Mr. Tamimi, that is Hamas, has declared uh, by the spokesman of Hamas, Mr. Uh, Fauzi Marhoum, just the other day, that Hamas is now ready to accept the uh, uh, solution based uh, on the 1967 borders. And just the two days ago, uh, Mushir al-Masri, another spokesman of Hamas, has said that Hamas is ready to respond positively to to the idea of Mufaz uh, talking about speaking about the provisional state uh, within 60% uh, of the uh, territories the occupied territories so i wonder if uh, mr tamimi still thinks that uh, mr arafat who never signed any final peace treatment with israel treaty with israel is a, a be betrayer to the palestinian cause at the same time when hamas who represent his own views is ready now to accept a prov provisional state it's quite ironic let's go to yuri avneri now well, because we don't want to go down this road too much. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Oslo, because whenever we talk about Arafat nowadays, uh, we, you know, Oslo naturally uh, props up. Uh, as cynical as it may sound, has those famous days in, in Oslo and the famous Oslo Accords, have they become almost an irrelevance because of the facts on the ground, given that the occupation has been ongoing for over 41 years? and uh, also that Israel continues to build settlements day after day in the West Bank. I think the main element of the Oslo agreement was that for the first time the government of Israel recognized the existence and the rights of the Palestinian people. You remember Golda Meir saying there is no such thing as the Palestinian people. In Oslo, Israel recognized the Palestinian people and this will cannot go back, that is there. And of course, the Palestinian people recognize the fact that there is an Israeli nation. However it was created, however this thing came about, is irrelevant. The question is, the Israeli nation is there and will not go away. The Palestinian people are there and will not go away. And apart from the two-state solution, which was devised by Yasser Arafat, I don't think there's any solution on the table. The, the only alternative is a kind of uh, South African apartheid state 
in which there will be an eternal struggle between Jews and Arabs. And therefore, the Oslo Agreement is relevant. The agreement itself was deeply flawed. Yas Arafat himself said, it is the best possible agreement in the worst possible circumstances. The gap of power between Israel and Palestinian was immense. It is still immense. The flaw of the agreement was that the Palestinian side knew exactly what it wanted. Arafat devised a peace plan which stands until today, it's the Palestinian state in all the occupied territories, the Green Line at the border, and East Jerusalem as the capital of Palestine. On the Israeli side, there was no clear-cut aim at all. Yitzhak Rabin did not really know what exactly he had in mind for the final settlement. And this was the flaw, because when you, do, when you don't have an agreed aim, all the interim steps are, look different to the, two, to the two sides. And this is how the uh, agreement came to naught. But any future solution must be based on the same principles. A Palestinian state, a free Palestinian state, alongside a free Israeli state, with a green line at the border, with perhaps ex exchange of small territories, with East Jerusalem as the capital of the sovereign state of Palestine. It, this will come about, I'm quite sure that it will, because there is no other way. And if those pessimists who say uh, this is impossible or it's become irrelevant, yes, yesterday we celebrated the fall of the Berlin Wall, and I think one month before the fall of the wall, there was not one single German on either side who believed that this will come about in their lifetime. We must have faith in the future and the, rely on the fact that these two people must come to an agreement if they want to live. Jamal Nazal, I, I saw you nodding in agreement. Is, is Oslo still the foundation stone for any further um, agreements and any final status agreement? And also, should Palestinians continue to dream, like Germans did, that the Berlin Wall would go down? Yeah, I mean, hope should die as a last thing. I believe that there is hope. I, I, I still strongly believe that the Palestinian state will come about. Uh, but it is it is ironic that uh, we have an, a government in Israel that is hostile to the idea of peace and peacemaking, and we have a political entity in Gaza that shares the same uh, the same principles. There is an invisible alliance between the Israeli right wing of politics and Hamas. Both of them reject the roadmap. Both of them reject uh, the idea of a Palestinian state. Both Israel and Hamas reject the UN resolutions as a as a uh, terms of reference for the peace process. So these. These two partners need each other. They need to work with each other. They need to help each other in order to prevent the Palestinian state from becoming reality. This is why it seems apparent that Mr. Netanyahu is doing his best to keep Hamas in power in, power in Gaza. Hamas is doing absolutely nothing to fight against the Israeli occupation, nor in the Gaza Strip, neither in the West Bank. And there is a okay. there is a now uh, Hamas has stopped all hostile activities towards Israel in exchange for nothing. So this is the real betrayal of the Palestinian cause. I believe that the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian government, President Abbas, the PLO, the Fatah movement are still committed to the idea of the two-state solutions that uh, we, are, we abide by the commitment of Arafat signed in the, in the Oslo Accord that we will respect the existence of Israel as long as it respects the existence of the Palestinian people and their uh, legitimate aspiration to build their own okay. state. Okay, Azam Tamimi, the Israeli right and Hamas are the real enemies of peace, says Jamal Nazar. Well, you should have uh, brought a spokesman for Hamas since you had a spokesman for Fatah. Uh, I don't speak for Hamas. I speak for myself as a Palestinian. You do? I speak for my mother who died uh, hoping and longing to return uh, to their home. Uh, I speak for my father who wanted to go back to his land. I speak for the millions of Palestinians whose right of return is sold out as a result of a two-state solution. The two-state solution so do actually... I. So do I. The two-state solution was a rescue plan for the Zionist project. 
so that the Zionists can still occupy much of the land that they, they've been occupying since 1948. Now, let this not be a, a polemic about who is a partner to the Israelis. Everybody knows. The people who have been working with the Israelis since Oslo, even before Oslo, the people who have benefited from VIP status, the people who are today being led by Dayton in the West Bank and arresting and incarcerating and uh, persecuting the Palestinians in the West Bank in order to provide security for the Israelis. These are the true partners of Israel. Mahmoud Abbas and uh, Jamal Nazal and uh, these kind of people. These are the partners of Israel. Yuri Avneri does May it. I inter well, so, sorry to uh, come in there, Jamal Nazal. I just want a comment from Yuri Avneri. Yuri Avneri, uh, does it disappoint you when you hear uh, the criticism on both sides from both Mr. Nazal and Tamimi? I'm a little bit sad about it because the Palestinian people okay. need unity. The Palestinian struggle for liberation is in the middle, it's not at the end. I don't think the Palestinian people can afford the luxury of such a deep split with so much hatred on both sides. I would like to make peace between these two uh, Palestinian friends and g get them together. Uh, I think Hamas, I, I think Hamas knows by now that there are no military means to achieve peace. Hamas has made an, a kind of ceasefire with Israel because it has reached the conclusion that by military means uh, the Palestinian side will not achieve uh, its victory. Uh, it is world pressure, world public opinion, the intervention of world governments, the Israeli public opinion, the Palestinian public opinion, which must work together to achieve the peace. I, I admit our government, this, at this moment, we have a government which is not uh, uh, very much enthusiastic about peace. They don't like peace. They don't like peace because they don't want to withdraw and dismantle the settlements. The pressure to dismantle the settlements must come from inside Israel. And it will come from inside Israel only if there's a cooperation between the Israeli peace movement and the Palestinian people and world public opinion. This is the only way we can affect the breakthrough which we need in which uh, Yasser okay. Arafat was thinking about. Jamal Nazal. Yasser Arafat, uh, so, so Yasser Arafat realized. Yes, please. Uh, can I bring in, sorry to interrupt you, I want to bring in Jamal Nazal because he, he wanted to make a point there. I would love to hear Uri himself being a, a greatly recognized histor historian. I would like to see him remind us of uh, the great help Hamas has received from Israel back in the late 80s when Israel helped creating the Hamas. It helped creating this monster, monster which it now cannot lock into the box that it belongs to. Now, I remember in the late 80s when, when the uh, organization, the, uh, the actors of the Palestinian civil society affiliated with the PLO were prohibited and outlawed by Israel. I remember between 88 and 93, Israel gave permission to Hamas to establish seven, 741 foundations that built the backbone of Hamas in the Palestinian territories. There is no love between Hamas and Israel. I do know that. But I know too that Hamas is an enemy to the idea of peace in as much as Mr. Netanyahu is. This is why I still strongly believe in my theory, which I have extended to you a minute earlier. I may remind Mr. Tamimi that just today I have two reports in my hand. One of them is from a Palestinian human rights organization called Mizan. The other is called Al-Damir. Both of them, Mr. Tamimi, accuse Hamas of committing crimes against its own people. There are severe human rights violations in Gaza now, undertaken by Hamas, just as bad ones that have but, taken place on the hand of the Israelis. But Mr. Nazal, there's also human rights groups saying that uh, the West Bank has become effectively a police state as well in the past couple of years. It is not. It is absolutely not. You, well, you know, 
Uh, Emram, you need to visit the West Bank to see the great wind of change that has taken place there. There is a different society now, different from the one that I have seen two years and a half ago, before the Annapolis process has started. Now we have a credible uh, and committed Palestinian police force that can okay. establish law and order. People feel safer in the Palestinian areas, in the Palestinian, in the A category, in the A areas of the Palestinian Authority. Now there is a phenomenon going on in the C areas, that is the uh, part of the West Bank which is under the Israeli right. control. Hamas is building a visible arsenal under the watchful eye of the Israeli army okay. in the place which is controlled by Israel, preparing for the uh, implementation of the idea of the provisional state. Okay. Now, if I may go back to... Oh, I, I, I'm going to gonna come in. I, want to, I have to interrupt you now. I need to bring in Azam Tamimi, uh, Tamimi and this conversation is going off like a wild horse into a different direction. I want to go back to Yasser Arafat. Azam Tamimi, do you reject the idea that there may have been unity amongst the Palestinians had Yasser Arafat been alive now? Yes, of course. Uh, the last uh, few years uh, of the life of Yasser Arafat uh, saw a warming up between uh, Hamas and Fatah. Uh, Yasser Arafat was on the phone for much of the time with Khalid Mish'al and others uh, because Yasser Arafat realized uh, that uh, the, the project, the Oslo project was getting nowhere and he was being punished by the Israelis uh, and their allies in America and in Europe when he was uh, placed under siege simply because he refused to go all the way that they planned, they had planned for him. And that's why they got rid, they got rid of him and brought uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, and, and therefore, yes, it, it, is, it might have been possible had he still been alive and had he been uh, free to, uh, to, to resume activities. But uh, it is people around him who actually conspired against him and killed him eventually. Finally, I just want to go to Yuri Avneri and, and talk a little bit about when Arafat died five years ago. When he died, it can be argued that there was a strange sense of good riddance to that obstacle to peace that, that sometimes came through in mainstream media in the West, but not only in the media, some of the politicians that even negotiated with him, some of the things that were said about him were hardly glowing obituaries. Even Bill Clinton said, I quote, I regret that in 2000 he missed the opportunity to bring that nation into being. Why do you think there was that trend of, of good riddance in many ways when Arafat died, particularly from some very senior statesmen? I think the, this reaction was one of the most stupid political reaction ever. The demonization of Yasser Arafat, which was actively uh, conducted by our Israeli propaganda machine and uh, supported by the Americans was a very stupid thing because Arafat was the man who had the authority, who uh, enjoyed the trust of the Palestinian people and not only was he willing and able to reach a peace agreement but he was also able to convince the Palestinian people to accept this peace ag agreement. I think even our friends from Hamas accepted the leadership of Arafat in spite of all the criticism and I myself have heard from Yasser Arafat uh, several times uh, he spoke very positively about Sheikh uh, Ahmed Yassin there was mutual some kind of mutual trust between them in spite of the differences mm -hmm. of opinion Arafat the assassination of Yasser Arafat the assassination of Yasser Arafat was a catastrophe not only for the Palestinian people but I believe to the Israeli people too. And I, the, okay. this remark by Bill Clinton, I think should be forgotten because, because Bill Clinton betrayed the trust of Arafat after Camp David. Okay. When he tried to convince Arafat to come to Camp David, he promised him not to blame anyone if okay, the conference fails. We have run out of time. Apologies for interrupting. Gentlemen, thank you very much, Jamal Nazal, Azam Tamimi and Yuri Avneri. It was informative hearing your different views on a contested legacy of Yasser Arafat. Thanks, gentlemen, and thank you so much, the viewer, for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. Bye-bye.